Hello and welcome to the next video in my series on basic statistics. If you are new to the channel, welcome. If you're a returning viewer, great to have you back. At the end, if you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others who you think might benefit from watching. So let's go ahead and get started. So this video is the next in our series on basic descriptive statistics. In the previous video, we talked about how to summarize data for categorical variables. In this one, we're going to start talking about how to summarize data for quantitative variables. More specifically, we're gonna talk about histograms. Now again, this is not overly difficult content, but it is foundational for understanding topics that are gonna come later. So having a good firm grasp of quantitative variables and histograms will take you a long way in topics to come. So let's go ahead and begin. This video is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. Now you're here watching this video because you want to learn something. And I can think of few better places to learn things than The Great Courses Plus. Now I have more information in the description below and a link to a free trial that is made available to my viewers. So click on the link and check out The Great Courses Plus. So I talked in the last video about categorical data and I'm not gonna go through this whole slide but just kind of give a summary. So remember that categorical data uses labels, names, or other descriptors to identify exclusive categories or types of things. So region, machine, or car make. Whereas quantitative data are numerical values that represent frequency, measurement, etc. So categories versus quantitative data. So we could have sales in millions of dollars, for example, or the number of production units made by the machines up above or the fastest car that's made by each manufacturer. So you can see the difference. Counting up categorical data is fairly straightforward. We just count how many unique classes we have in each category. So we could have 14 factories in the north, nine in the south, and so on and so on. Quantitative data is a bit different, okay? It's a measurement. And the way we represent those in descriptive statistics is also different. So we wanna make sure we understand that fundamental idea as we progress throughout the video. So in the last video, we talked about smartphone users here in the US. And what we did is we collected the manufacturing brand of that phone. So we had Apple, Samsung, HTC, Motorola, and I think other. Now in this fictitious data, we also collected that user's age, which of course is a quantitative variable. So you can see our first smartphone user was 58 years old. If we go across the right, the next one was 23, 57, 44, et cetera. So we have the brand of the phone they use, which is a categorical variable like Apple, HTC, et cetera. And we also have their age, which is a quantitative variable. So how do we represent this and how do we make sense of all this data? So first let's talk about buckets and bins. So let's say we have a bucket or a bin, same thing. And in this bucket, we're gonna put everyone in our data set who is age 18 or older. Now, I know, because I made the data, that that's everyone. And we have 100 people in our sample. So all 100 people go into this bucket. Now, having a bucket full of 100 people doesn't really tell us a whole lot you know, of detail about all the people that are in there. So what we can do is split it up into smaller buckets. So we make three other buckets. Now we say, Everyone that's 18 to 39 years of age goes in the first bucket. Everyone that's 40 to 59 goes in the middle bucket. And everyone that's 60 years old or older goes in the third bucket. So we do that. We have 39 people in the first one, 45 people in the second one, and 16 people in the third one. Now you can see that splitting people up in the different buckets by their age gives us what I call a lot better resolution on our data. So we can see that our data set is definitely skewed, we'll talk more about that in a second, is skewed towards younger individuals. Okay, so we have 39, 45, and then 16. We don't have very many people over 60 in our sample as using smartphones. So we have a much better idea of the distribution of our data as far as age goes. Now notice our bins are exclusive. So we go 18 to 39, 40 to 59, and 60 and above. There's no overlap. So someone cannot be in two buckets at the same time. They are exclusive buckets or bins. But we could continue that further. 
Now we can split it up into six buckets. So we could have 18 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, etc. And then further put those people into buckets. So now we have 24 in the first one, 15, 23, 22, 15, and 1. And again, this gives us more resolution into the age distribution of our data. So this is the fundamental concept in creating histograms. We put all of our quantitative data into buckets or bins that don't overlap, they butt up against each other, and then we put the number of observations we have in that range in that bucket. And that gives us better resolution of our data and tells us a lot about the distribution. Now an obvious question is, how many bins should you have? And the thing is, there's no easy or definitive answer to that question. So too few bins can create a histogram that doesn't show the shape or the distribution of the underlying data, what I call a histoblob, because you can't see how people are distributed in this case among the different age groups. Now too many bins create a histogram where there are too few observations in each bin and then the overall shape of the distribution is too broken up. So before we had ages of 10 years old, approximately, to, you know, 10 years of age between the, in the bins, and that was pretty good. Now we could take that down to five year bins or two year bins, but when we get that far, we're gonna start having empty bins, or we're gonna have bins with only one, two or three people in it. And looking at that doesn't make hardly any sense. So the thing is we have to find a balance between having too few bins and too many bins. So there's kind of a sweet spot that provides balance between those two extremes. Sometimes it depends on the data you have. So the width of the bin or the size of the bin or bucket just depends on what kind of data you are measuring. Sometimes you choose based on convenience. So in this case, we tend to choose these age groups because it's convenient. So 20 to 29 is convenient, 30 to 39, so we have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and above. It's convenient. Now, sometimes the software you're using will choose automatically for you based on some underlying algorithm. And in some cases you can override that, in some cases you get what you get. So when it comes to deciding how many bins you have in your histogram, again, there's no clear cut answer. There are some formulas out there that will claim to, you know, sort of operationalize how many bins you should have. But in practice, that doesn't always work. So use common sense, look at your data, find a happy medium when you're deciding how wide the bins are in your histogram. So we've said it many times, but what is a histogram? Now in my opinion, it is arguably the most useful preliminary visualization for quantitative data. And again, it's very straightforward and simple. It shows the shape of the distribution of values. So are most of our values in the middle of our histogram? or kind of are they on one end, or what does the shape look like? So the horizontal or the x-axis of a histogram is the variable of interest. In this case, it's age. The vertical or the y-axis can summarize the frequency, the relative frequency or percent frequency of the number of observations in a certain bin. So we can create a vertical rectangle for each class or bin, and the height of that rectangle is determined, again, by the frequency, relative frequency, or percent frequency of the number of observations in that bin. Now, there's no space or gaps between bars of a histogram. So compared to a vertical bar chart, which has gaps between each bar, a histogram does not have any gaps. The bars butt up against one another. So earlier I said the word skew. Now, what is that? Now, when your distribution or histogram is plotted, you make a graph of it, it can take very distinct shapes. So one is a skewed distribution. Now we call this one a left skew. And the easy way to remember that is the skew name is determined where the histogram is sort of the smallest or the thinnest on the end. So you can see here in the left skew that the data is kind of lumped to the right and the tail of the distribution gets more narrow to the left. So that's left skew. And of course, we have the opposite, which is right skew. In this case, the tail is thinner or longer on the right side, and the observations kind of clump up on the left side. 
So left skew means a thin left tail, right skew means a thinner right tail in the graph. So there are also other shapes. We can have a symmetric. Now this looks like maybe you've heard of the normal distribution, okay? But this is the idea of a histogram that is symmetric. So there are approximately as many observations on one side of the histogram as there are on the other. So it has symmetry. We have another that could be called bimodal. And what we mean by that is it kind of looks like a camel. It has two or more kind of peaks or humps that are distinct in the histogram. So here you can see we have sort of a peak on the left and a peak on the right. So we might characterize this as bimodal. And you can see that it's different than the other ones. So we had a skew to the left, a skew to the right. We had a symmetric here on, the, on this slide. And now we have a bimodal over here on this side. Four distinct shapes when it comes to looking at histograms. Now we could also have what's called a uniform histogram. And that's where the number of observations in each bin is the same or pretty close to being the same. So the histogram basically looks like a rectangle. So the number of observations in the first bin are the same as the fifth bin as the one on the end. So a uniform histogram. Or we can have one that this doesn't really have any pattern at all. There's no symmetry to it. There's no skew to it. It's not uniform. There's no bimodal qualities to it. So it's kind of like a random um, histogram. Now we'll say that if you choose too few of bins, so you don't have enough bins, your histogram can kind of start looking like a uniform histogram over here on the left. It's just like a big block. If you choose too many bins, your histogram can start to look like what you see over here on the right. Because you have chosen too many bins, there aren't enough observations in each bin to show any sort of pattern or shape to the data. So just keep that in mind. So again, here is our data, and that's now make some histograms based off this data. So here is what I call the histo blob. We have one bin. So everybody in our data set is lumped into this one bin. So you can see that there's only one big fat bar here, and the frequency goes up to 100 because we have 100 people in our sample. Well, this is not any good, okay? This is like the first bucket we did a previous, a few slides ago, where we had everybody in one bucket or bin. So let's do three bins. And we're gonna make each bin or bucket 20 years wide approximately. So here you can see at the bottom, we have approximately age 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and 60 to 80, okay? And then we can see how many people fall within that bin. So we have about you know, a little bit under 40 for the first group. We have about 45 for the second group or bin. And then we have, and then we have about 15 for the third bin, which is anyone over 60. Now you can see our data is starting to take a, a shape. Okay, it's still kind of a histo blob in my opinion. So we want to cut this data up a little bit more. So now let's look at six bins that are 10 years wide each. Now we can begin to see a little bit more resolution in our data. So everyone up to age 30, we can see we've got about 24 people in that group. And then we have about 15 people in the 30s and then about 23 people in their 40s. And again, it becomes much easier to see the general shape of our data. Now look at 12 bins that are five years in width. Now see, I think this is too much. So we have each bin is about five years wide. The exception is the first bin because we have 18 and 19 year olds in there, which is not a big deal. Okay, but we have the ones that are approximately five years wide. I think in this case, we're starting to get um, to a point where we have too few people in our bins. So you can see we only have like seven people in their late 30s. We only have one person you know, in their early 70s. We have about five or six people in the early 60s. And the number of observations in each bin is getting a bit too low. So I think it's usable, but I think we're getting to the point where it might be a bit too small of a bin range of five years. So again, this is kind of a bit of, you know, personal choice and a little bit of art to it. I mean, I would prefer the six bin or 10 year one over here on the left, but I think the one over here on the right where it's five years in each bin is usable, but it's getting to the point where we might have too many bins.
So let's look at how we did this. So we have our smartphone user age bin. Those are our ranges. Again, you'll notice that they are all inclusive. So every age is represented, but they don't overlap and they butt up against each other. So we progress from one to the other and they're all approximately the same width. I went ahead and included the 18 and 19 year olds um, in the first bin just for convenience, but normally you might separate that out, you know, into people that are under 20 if you want to. But we have 24 people in that first bin, 15, 23, 22, 15, and one. Now we make sure that our frequencies for each bin add up to our total, which is 100, and it does. And then we can see how that corresponds to our histogram over here on the right. It's just the height of the bars in the histogram. Now we can also do this with relative frequency. It doesn't really change things a whole lot. So remember relative frequency is the frequency of that observation class over the total number of observations. So it was Samsung had 28 people and therefore we had 20 over 100. So our relative frequency was 0.28. Now this is the exact same thing for histograms, except all we're doing is dividing the number of people in that bin divided by the total number of people. So we have 18, 29 year olds had 24 people in that bin. Therefore it's 24 divided by 100 and therefore the relative frequency of that bin in the histogram is 0.24. It's just simple division. So we could do a relative frequency histogram that would look just like this, okay? Again, in this case, because we have 100 observations, it's much easier, but the shape of the histogram looks the exact same. So you can use frequency or relative frequency, it just depends on what you wanna do and your specific application or your requirements. This video is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus, where you can get unlimited access to over 8,000 different video lectures taught by award-winning professors from the Ivy League and other top schools around the world. You can learn about anything that interests you, science, literature, and yes, statistics, like this lecture from Professor Michael Starbird called Data and Distributions, Getting the Picture, from his course, Meaning from data, statistics made clear. And right now, The Great Courses Plus is offering my viewers a free trial. So go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Brandon Foltz to have access to the 8,000 video lecture library or click the link in the description below. Okay, so that wraps up this video on basic descriptive statistics where we learned about how to summarize data for quantitative variables, specifically how to make histograms. Remember, it's just about creating bins and buckets for your data, putting the number of observations in those bins or buckets that one, are all inclusive, so everyone has a bucket or bin to go in. They're the same width, so in this case, you know, 10 years, five years, whatever it is, and they meet up against each other. So they're continuous from age to age. So you put that data in those bins or buckets, make a bar for each one, and again, in histograms, the bars meet each other, and then you'll have a general overall shape of your data. And histograms are extremely useful and they appear everywhere in statistics, analytics, and other quantitative applications like data science and so forth. So histograms are definitely one of those things you should have a firm grasp of. Thank you very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.